Thank you very much. It's um, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I haven't been here actually in Paris that long, but I'm, uh, I was the first Australian here before Matthias. I mean, I sort of tell you that. I was also the first Australian ever uh, uh, elected to, uh, to run the International Chamber of Commerce in its 100 years history. And I know I share that with my, my mate uh, Matthias, who's the first Australian to lead the OECD. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. I'm looking in the audience. I heard a couple of voices that I've heard before, which is always good. In fact, the uh, Brazilian ambassador to the OECD, I remember a meeting we had with your Minister of Commerce uh, when he visited um, uh, Paris on the way for some discussions here. We have a lot of activity in LATAM. But I would encourage you, as the, those of you who are ambassadors here, uh, we have a number of um, ambassadors who, uh, when they have visiting ministers of finance, et cetera, uh, who are in, very interested in business, who come to see us in Avenue to President Wilson and our offices there. So if there's uh, an opportunity, we're very happy to engage. We are uh, actually in 170 countries. So uh, we encapsulate and incorporate all the members of the OECD and those that are seeking membership as well. So our, our engagement is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is always open uh, to, to visiting uh, ministers. We have many come to see us, but I encourage you to think about that. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the other element that um, uh, I think I should just point out, because it happened uh, really only in the last uh, six or eight months after uh, Matthias Cormann uh, uh, began his, role, his, his reign of terror here, was that um, we signed up uh, for the first time a formal relationship between the International Chamber of Commerce and the OECD, reflecting very much, I think, the increased interest, but also the increased importance of engagement with the private sector more broadly. Uh, and those areas that we cover are pretty substantial, actually. We're already working with the OECD, particularly on the tax agenda, as you would know, the whole inclusive framework because of what we bring, which is the business communities from outside the OECD family and within the OECD family. So if you're talking about inclusive frameworks, being able to bring in uh, least developed country business communities, developing country business communities, that's what we do. But we're doing that more formally now, corrupt, uh, cooperating in anti-corruption, supply chain due diligence, competition policy on sustainability, the circular economy, I, when I was just listening to the comments before, very relevant, and of course the digital economy, and we go on. Uh, we work well with SME access to finance, illicit trade and intellectual property, and we go on. So there's a whole area now with specific action plans as well. And, and it's just interesting for me because this is part of a trend we're seeing where the private sector is actually seen not just a, as a useful conversationalist, but actually integral to the work of a number of international organizations. And we could talk at length about uh, all these areas. But today, um, I want to take a step back and look at the theme that underpins, or at least affects, almost all of our complex policy areas. And that has increasing relevance to business today. And that is the business of geopolitics and the geopolitics of business. So for many in business and government alike, uh, Putin's announcement on 20 February uh, came as something of a shock that Russia would be conducting a so-called special military operation in Ukraine, subsequently the largest land invasion uh, in Europe since the world, since Second World War seemed impossible to consider previously. Uh, Putin invoked the other Vladimir, Vladimir Lenin, in his spurious revisionist argument justifying the war. He said, Ukraine has no historical claim to independent statehood and that modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia, or to be more precise, by Bolshevik, communist Russia. Putin said explicitly that Soviet Ukraine is the result of the Bolsheviks' policy and can rightfully be called Vladimir Lenin's Ukraine. And Lenin was its creator and architect. But Mr. Putin's subtext and the implications for business could be better described not by a Lenin reference, but by a Trotsky quote. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. So the first point I would like to make is a variation of the theme today. Business may not be interested, frankly, in geopolitics, just want to get on with stuff, but geopolitics is interested in business. So let's consider in brief some of the events over the past few years. I think we all know that US-China relationships are not what they were. It's led to a spate of trade restrictions, complicating supply networks, creating the most serious prospect of military conflict in decades. We know that there's a battle for critical resources. We heard a little bit, about, a little bit of that before in the previous uh, uh, d uh, presentation. We know that that's erupted with manufacturers the world over in the firing line. 
We know that Europe's tougher approach to China has delayed indefinitely the investment deal negotiated over many years. We know that the approach, this approach has led to a tightening of foreign investment rules around the world and pretends a, a much more confrontational relationship with many risks for business. There's been a drift towards creating expansive tools of intervention in the economy on the sometime, sometimes tenuous national security grounds, such as invoking curiously security laws to procure such military necessities as baby formula. The colonial pipeline cyber attack in the US last year, and by the way, one of the um, other elements of my life is I sit on a number of boards, uh, including investment boards, and one of the investments we have is actually in colonial. We actually own airports, we own tollways, we own, uh, we own uh, water companies all around the world. But that cyber attack highlighted not only the serious damage cyber criminals groups can do, but it also signaled a splintering of approaches to regulating the internet and cross-border data flows across geopolitical lines. The global response to the pandemic was undermined, frankly, by geopolitical factors. Each country put themselves first with vaccine nationalism. Many imposed export restrictions on medicines and protective equipment. And a race for influence through vaccine diplomacy had major economic implications that have set the world on a course for recession. And we heard the compounding upon compounding before. And frankly, from my experience, also sitting on these boards and looking at the assets we own, the real black swan in the pandemic was actually not the pandemic, was actually the failure of international cooperation. I went through all the assets we own. We own airports. We just wrote the largest single check ever in Australia to buy Sydney Airport at $23 billion. So I went through all those assets and all their risk management plans, and we all had strategies for dealing with the pandemic. What we were not aware was the context was such which actually gave rise to this lack of international cooperation. And that has led to a significant series of, of interruptions to supply chain networks. And of course, most recently, there is Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. We know that Ukraine's economy has been decimated. We know that comprehensive sanctions have hurt Russia's economy and caused and prompted an exodus of companies from advanced economies. Global logistics and wheat supplies have been massively interrupted. So many international fora are critical to economic growth and important, therefore, to business, such as the G20 and APEC, have had their agendas hijacked and become almost dysfunctional, limping along without the prospect of substantive activity, uh, even at the end of this year in Jakarta and then in Bangkok as well, because they cannot reach agreement on communiques, etc. And the war has exacerbated a food and energy crisis that is already placing a significant burden on emerging economies. And we know because more than two thirds of the ICC is in developing and emerging and middle economies, which are now all seen as fragile economies for a variety of reasons. As we've already seen through the change of government in Sri Lanka, protests from Gelders all the way through to Jak Jakarta, this crisis is leading to social and political unrest in many parts of the world interrupting the way in which business can operate. And so many developing countries desperately need additional liquidity. And that is why we've been arguing, I actually was just in Washington last week meeting with Treasury there, for a special drawing rights, spe an additional issuance of that. But of course that is being compounded because bad actors who are members of the IMF, such as Russia and others, may well be able to access those. So there's an interruption again. Of course, a failure to provide the liquidity is leading to the risk of default. And of course, we know from economic history, a combination of defaults with business activity goes bad. And that's something we see, and that is bad for business. Friends, summer in Paris has ended. Autumn has begun, but a cold, cold winter is before us. Past organisers of this forum could have been forgiven for not considering geopolitics on a session with its, business, with its members. But it's now clearer than ever that political frictions between nations are obviously heating up and that these can very easily affect companies' operations, its performance and our people. Matters once the exclusive province of national security officials and governments now affect us all. In particular, they affect the manufacturing, logistical and supply networks that underpin our global economy and the companies that run them. In a way, this is nothing new. Indeed, this is the history of the International Chamber of Commerce. We were founded more than 100 years ago in 1919 as a, 
as an analog, in a sense, to the League of Nations, and we continue to exist. But the ICC was founded by a visionary group of European industrialists after the forced nationalizations, that's what they were reacting to, and the extraordinary dislocations caused by the First World War. But today's world is extremely fractious, and more and more companies and industries are being involved. Trade barriers and sanctions appear ever expanding with few signs that conditions will change that will allow for their winding back. What are the conditions which need to actually be met to see the withdrawal of sanctions on Russia? What is the end game in terms of those sanctions? Stricter foreign investment screening laws have become the norm, and we see that in Europe, we see that in Australia, and these tend to affect a wider circle of companies and industries than previously. And more generally, geopolitical events can affect a wide range of business functions, from m and to finance, to legal, to security, government relations, and to corporate strategy, just to getting people to work. Moreover, as Ukraine shows, some can have clear tangible impacts on financial and currency markets. So point one is that today's geopolitics profoundly affects business and it will probably get worse. And if we accept the proposition of the previous seeker, this is not going to end soon. In fact, my discussions in Brussels, and I know there are uh, European ambassadors and business people here, the idea here is to exclude Russia from global economic activity, not for one generation, but for two generations. What are the consequences of that? That is an announced strategy that has been put to people. Point two, however, is that businesses are not just bystanders or victims of the geopolitical competition of states, but also, and increasingly, participants in this new great game. In other words, to answer Trotsky's aphorism, businesses are starting to get interested in geopolitics. You can see this in many data. In the May data that came out from Edelman on the trust barometer, which surveyed 14,000 employees across 14 mostly OECD countries. Friends, 59%, 59% of surveyed employees thought their company had geopolitical responsibilities, such as punishing countries that violate human rights and international law. 95% of employees believe companies should respond to an unprovoked invasion by speaking out, applying political or economic pressure, and combating misinformation, traditional dimensions of statecraft, but also by ceasing new business investments and terminating business activities. And business action is expected on geopolitics beyond active conflicts. If you look at Edelman, 95% of employees also want their companies to take these sorts of actions if a country has a repressive government, however that is defined. 97%, so just 3% short of 100% if a country has abusive labour practices. And 94% if a country has inadequate environmental protections. This, this is a really a interesting set of numbers. This is an overwhelming voice from employees to businesses about what's expected of them in the context not just of geopolitical crises and conflict, but also in the context of the world as we're seeing it today. And of course, this holds true then for business leaders. I mean, I sit on boards, no doubt many of you who sit on boards sit on boards as well. And we are increasingly in acting in line with these expectations, factoring geopolitical trends, events and consequences into our decision making. Right now, in Europe, obviously, we're largely concerned with Russia. But many are also worried about a similar playbook being used for China, where there is much more at stake economically. And they are concerned about a broader, albeit more amorphous, prospect that globalization may go from a period of relative stagnation and uncertainty into hard reverse. After all, it's hard to think of a worse outcome for global enterprises than the world drifting into exclusive trading blocks along geopolitical lines. And so businesses are taking a range of actions to minimize minimize their exposure to such risks, including through geopolitical risk monitoring and horizon, channing, uh, horizon scanning, looking at supply chains, the way which they operate, all these elements I'm sure that you discuss in this forum. But equally important, many businesses are becoming much more actively involved in solving many of the underlying problems that lead to affect or are affected by geopolitical competition. They are taking action on climate change, often at a pace, ambition and scale, draw, drawing, uh, dwarfing that of states. I know that because we crowd in business into the COP27 process. We, we crowd in business on a continual basis into how do we actually enable the transition. While this may not sound like a response to geopolitics, in actual fact it is. Moving to a more renewable energy base will have profound implications for the ability of countries to use oil, gas and other resources as leverage in their interstate uh, relations. 
Businesses, meanwhile, are trying to stem the bleeding from the food crisis. Companies are working with the World Food Program, for example, to help deliver essentials to the most vulnerable countries. In fact, we worked actively at the ICC to do just that. In Afghanistan, obviously in Ukraine, in Yemen and elsewhere, the ICC works to crowd in business experience to enable that to happen. And businesses are, as demonstrated by participation in today's event, involving themselves wherever they can in international policy making processes across an extraordinarily, extraordinarily broad range. Our experience, and no doubt that of the OECD, is that companies add significant value through helping policymakers understand the realities of doing business. Being part of designing policies always makes the implementation more likely to be successful. And by making sure that these policies are actually then designed in an effective way. Failure, on the other hand, to engage with business in policy development can have major adverse consequences. Just witness the misunderstanding of policymakers of the real and unintended impacts of sanctions and the understandable overcompliance and de-risking ex exercised by business in response. But business engagement is also critical because the reality is that no major global challenge can be solved without the active involvement of the private sector. Think of a major global challenge that can be solved without the active involvement of the private sector. And in many cases, as the institutional representatives of over 45 million businesses, as I said, we provide the channel for private sector participation in matters of geopolitical significance. We act as the primary voice of the real economy in a range of intergovernmental organizations, from the United Nations to the World Trade Organization to the COP process itself. We champion the needs of local business in global decision making and we serve as the world's largest, frankly, and still functioning second track diplomatic network. A good example of our work is as the private sector representative in the UN Secretary General's Global Crisis Response Group to the food, finance and energy crisis caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is the first time ever the private sector has been structurally integrated into a crisis response by the United Nations. It's an increasing understanding that, that without the private sector, that response group could not be effective. There we've been working with shippers, logistics operators and banks to help shape the Black Sea Grain Initiative that unlocked millions of tonnes of wheat supplies for distribution to developing countries. Though I do note Putin's uh, threats to that very arrangement this morning in the, in the press. But whatever the venue, and now pleasingly increasingly at the OECD, we always take at the ICC a business-centric but purpose-led approach to our engagement. This is in line with our original mission to make business work for everyone, everywhere, every day. And this is directly in line with our historic vision of promoting cross-border commercial exchanges for the purposes of peace, prosperity and opportunity for all. So having spoken about how geopolitics affects business and how business is responding to geopolitics, my final point is to return to that revolutionary time of 1919 with Trotsky and Lenin. I want, to, I, want to, I want to start by asking the same question that Lenin did in the title of his famous pa pamphlet, Stod Yelitz, what is to be done? Unsurprisingly, my answer is somewhat different to a Bolshevik whose ideas may have shook the world for 10 days, ossified it into blocks for decades, and most recently been used as a pretext for an unjustified and illegal war. And my answer comes in two parts. First, for business, Perhaps the most important response is to fully acknowledge the truth of this misappropriated phrase of Trotsky that business may not be interested in geopolitics, but geopolitics is interested in business. Above all, above all, this means developing strategic responses to ensure that an understanding of world affairs permeates more broadly across all major business functions, particularly enlisted companies and large entities. And governments, for their part, should acknowledge that their geopolitical actions do not operate in a vacuum. That that they actually have major implications for their own business constituencies and that they should seriously take into account both the effects of their actions on business and also the way in which they go about creating and determining the actions to take. Practically, that means much greater scope for consulting and engaging business on foreign and defence policy, not just domestically, but also in groups like NATO. Who can forget the comments by the Secretary General of NATO, which is effectively business must just suck this up. That's not really an effective way of engaging with the business community if we want global solidarity in response to this illegal invasion. It means fully leveraging the power of the private sector to tackle issues of the global commons, most especially on climate change. And it means fully considering the damage that can easily occur when security considerations trump 
thoughtlessly economic ones. Our view is that it's always better to err on the side of retaining open tra trade settings. And amid all the policy surprises and political mistakes of the past several years, you cannot do much harm by bolstering our multilateral institutions. We can you cannot do much harm by more fully bringing on board the private sector to deal with matters on the international agenda. It is an innovation that is required to ensure we have effective international co cooperation in the 21st century. How we go about that and how we do that is a project we're working on at the ICC. Friends, the gap between how governments consult the private sector at home on domestic issues and how they do so on international issues is quite extraordinary and it must change. And in these complex geopolitical and business times, we can all do better. For that reason, I'm very glad to have been able to join you today and share some reflections on how we see the world and the implications for business and what we're thinking about. And I wish you all the best for the remainder of your discussions. Thank you very much.